Welcome to our Easter service here at Walnut Hill. I want to welcome all of you online. So glad you could join us in that way. And then in our campuses in New Milford, in Derby, and in Waterbury, and here in person, so good to be with you. Hasn't it been good to worship God in already so many different ways, through dance, through song, through scripture readings? It's just a, it's a great morning for us to be reminded of the truths of our belief in this Jesus. That These aren't just stories, but this is the God of the universe who came to earth to do something miraculous for us. Last week we talked a lot about who Jesus is. Pastor Ray gave us such a great sermon on some of the really solid truths about who Jesus is. And today, this passage describes what Jesus has done. That's important for us because it's one thing to know who Jesus is, isn't it? But it's a whole other thing than to apply that to what he has done. Because what he has done has the power to transform, friends, has the power to change our lives, has a power to give us an entirely new life. So it's something that is so exciting to look at and something, of course, on Easter Sunday that we should take a look at, and this passage does that for us. Now, it, it also has, there's a tension here in this passage. There's this tension between really the depth of sin and what it does to our lives as opposed to or what a relationship with Jesus can do. And so I'm actually gonna kind of dive a little bit into the depth of sin p- part, which we don't usually do on Easter morning. So can you stick with me for a few minutes on this one? Because the news, just so you know, it's good news in the end. But it starts out a little bit tough, I have to admit. So I wanted to start with a little bit of a lighthearted story. So let me read you this very short story. It's from a 17th century um, letter writing uh, interaction between two people. The first, her name is Lady Huntingdon. She was inviting her friend, her name was the Duchess of Buckingham, to hear George Whitfield preach. Who of you knows the name George Whitfield? By a raise of hands, just so I can, many of us, many of us. If you don't know who George Whitfield was, he was was an incredible preacher, an itinerant preacher who traveled all over the world sharing the gospel and having an incredible effect on people's lives um, with the gospel, with the sharing of this, this truth of Jesus. So this is what the Duchess of Buckingham writes back to Lady Huntington. It is monstrous to be told that you have a heart as sinful as the common wretches that crawl on the earth. This is highly offensive and insulting, and I cannot but wonder that your ladyship should relish any sentiments so much at variance with high rank and good breeding." Now, if I could do a good English accent, I would have, but I can't, because it even would have added a little more flourish to the story. Now, I know we kind of laugh at this story, and yet as I read it, I could find myself in her words, if I admit it to myself. Didn't want to. Maybe you don't either, but I could find myself in her words, because I have been offended at times in my life by the implication that I'm a sinner. Have you? I felt offended by it. I know for myself how I've, been re- how I've responded at times when I've been called out for my bad behavior. Can you relate to that? <laughs> or even worse, found out <laughs> for my bad behavior. I didn't even intend for it to be known, but I was found out. It's, even, it, it's one thing when your spouse finds you out. It's another thing when your kids find you out. That's even worse sometimes, but it happens to us all. Even under the best circumstances, when I've been personally convicted by the Holy Spirit, by my, of my own sin, it's so easy to make excuses for it. So easy. I can think of specific times, and I wish they were years and years ago, but even recently, <laughs> when I've become defensive, combative, kind of like Lady Huntington wanting to write out my reasons for why I'm doing a certain thing, to explain away the thoughts, the behaviors in my life, or even gone as far as tried to blame others for them. So I know I'm feeling a little bit of the heaviness in the room. We've all experienced this. This is the reality of sin, is it not? It's the reality of sin. So why did Jesus go to the cross? This morning I was thinking about the cross, an appropriate thing on a day like today. Isn't it amazing that we wear around our necks an instrument that was designed for torture at the highest level, but for us, 
It represents freedom. Maybe that's a little, a little aside, but certainly something to think on. Why did Jesus have to go to that cross? Why did he go? There's many, many wonderful scriptures throughout the Bible that describe it, but I picked one that I think captures it in just one verse. Isn't it beautiful when it's all boiled down into one verse? So look with me at 1 Peter 3, 18. It's gonna come on the screen for you. And it says this, Christ suffered for our sins once for all time. He never sinned, but he died for sinners, you and me, to bring you and me safely home to God. I love that, safely home to God. He suffered physical death, but he was raised to life in the spirit. It is all there. <laughs> life, death, resurrection, and what it means to you and me. A wonderful scripture. So why did he go to the cross? Out of love? To save us from our sins. That's what we boil it down to on a day like today and every day. We were far from God in our sin, but he willingly went to the cross. He died, and yet he was resurrected. He didn't stay in the grave, and he did this all to bring us back into relationship with God. So the good news is coming. I found, you know, I've been doing uh, ministry now for almost 25 years here at Walnut Hill Community Church, and I want to tell you that over that time, I found that here in Connecticut, one of the biggest hurdles for people who are sort of on their journey towards Jesus is this. They think that they're already good enough, and that by some cosmic equation out there, that their good deeds are going to outweigh their bad deeds, and that's going to be enough to get them into eternal glory. It's an epidemic. It's, I can't tell you how many conversations I've had with people where they've said, well, I'm a good person, right? What are you supposed to say to that question? You could say, no, I've seen what you've done. I mean, you, you stole my rake out of the, out of the yard and, and never gave it back. I mean, there, we know that we're not good in and of ourselves, but we still want to do this sort of equation and hope that it's going to turn out for us. Even Paul speaks about this. Paul is the writer of the book of Colossians and many, and really a lot of our New Testament. This is what he says. Now, he was a pretty good guy. <laughs> in the whole scheme of things, he had it going. He was a great Jew who followed the law, and he's one of the great writers of our scriptures. I mean, you would say this is a pretty good guy, right? But here's what he says about his best deeds on his best day. He says, the best I have to offer to God is worthless, like filthy rags. That's what he says about his best deeds, and he's a good guy. <laughs> but it offends us sometimes to be called sinners, but over and over again, our conscience and the Holy Spirit causes us to ask this question. I know everyone in this room has asked this question. Will the good that I'm doing be enough? Will it be enough? And scripture gives us a very clear answer. Absolutely not. It won't be enough. But that is why our God knew, he knew that we would never be enough for him. And that's why it pleased him to put all of his fullness in the person of Jesus Christ. All of his fullness. I, I, so I thought about the word full. Have you had moments in your life when you felt really full? I know I have. Now, I have to admit, the first thing that came to my mind was not a very ho high and holy thought. It was days in college. I went to a school at Wheaton College out in Illinois, you know, Chicagoland, where every chain restaurant is available just like a mile away. And I'm from Connecticut, I grew up in New Milford. We had like three restaurants in our whole town. None of them were chain restaurants and I found the most wonderful thing my freshman year of college. The Olive Garden, $9.99 all you can eat pasta bowls. They just kept them coming my friends. And my friends and I would go and we would you know, eat pasta till we could hardly move. Yeah, I've been back there since. That Olive Garden doesn't even exist anymore. Seems we ate them out of, out of house and home, and they're, and they're gone. But I tell you, I remember leaving feeling so full. Now, that's a silly kind of full, but what about those moments when you felt really full in the, in the best sense of the word? I think about my wedding day, October 21st, 2000. Who are those two people? <laughs> I promise, she's 23. 
What a day. What a day. I think back to that day. It was so full. I felt like the luckiest guy in the world. And then my whole family was there. The next photo shows all of my closest family in a room together, some of, some of whom have gone home to be with the Lord since that time. What a special moment. Can you remember moments like this where you, they were just full? And then the last photo from our wedding day, was we, it was full of laughter. That's Brian right there. Yes, it, it is. And he's making us laugh as he still does these days. And I love that that captures the fun, the fullness of the fun of that day. Then I think about some of the exciting times with my family over the years. I mean, what a special day to share Herb Brooks Arena with my family. This is like Mecca for the, all of us who love hockey. 1980 Olympic champs. We shared that special moment up in Lake Placid, New York. And more recently, we have traditions in our family, you probably do too, but I always feel so full when we go to cut down our Christmas tree. Don't care what the weather is, it just doesn't matter. I mean, even Bob was there, our dog. I mean, it was, what a full experience. I love it, it was such a great day, and those days are so wonderful. And then I think back over the years, times at the hockey rink. Here's the Blomquist family, Amy's family, after a game some years ago, great moments. And then a throwback to a few years ago, the Easter egg hunts at Grandma and Grandpa's house on Easter Sunday, usually, or Saturday. What wonderful moments of fullness. And then I can remember even recently, standing right over here on the stage, as I watched people come forward for prayer, right here in this sanctuary. Those are full moments. When I see the hand of God at work, when I see the Lord moving in power, full moments. And then a couple of things that you know that I love here I am actually in the Sea of Galilee about to baptize about 10 people and I'm teaching about baptism out of the Sea of Galilee. I mean, come on, what a day, what a day. And again, always laughter, always laughter and a little bit of fun, the next photo. Hey, you gotta, have, you gotta goof around in Israel too. These are full moments, just having good times together. And then come full circle, last year one of my great friends from Israel was walking, you know, on our traditional walk with our dog out at the golf course together. What a special moment. Azar was here in, at, at my house. I mean, what a full circle, full experience. Have you experienced those kind of moments in your life where you knew it was just full? Not every moment's like that, but so many are. I, I, I contemplated that word because in this scripture, it talks about the fullness of God in Christ. I wanna talk with you about that because it's so important. In the Old Testament, during the time of the Exodus, there was the tabernacle. Remember the tent that they set up, the meeting place where they, the presence of God would come and, and settle on it? And then later, Solomon builds a temple in, in Israel, in Jerusalem. It's the place where the Lord was present. Well, all that changes when Jesus comes to earth. God came to dwell with humanity and was fully in Jesus. That's what the scripture's telling us. What that means is that there was nothing of God that was not in Jesus. Now you may ask yourself, well, how come it doesn't show up all the time in Jesus? Read Philippians 2, it will tell you. He laid down his godness so that he could live a 100% human life and do what we could never do, be sinless and go to the cross for us. Wow, he loved us that much? Yeah, he did. He loved you that much that he would want to do that for you. The Greek word here is called pleroma, and it, it's used explicitly in this text to make sure that we know that the full complement of divine attributes, all of God, are found in Jesus. And if Jesus was fully God, it means that he was more than enough for us, more than enough for us. You wanna know God? Look at Jesus, look to the Savior, and you will see God he even said to his disciples, when they asked him, we wanna see God, just show us God, we'll be, show us God the Father and we'll be okay. And Jesus says, I've been walking around with you, I've been here with you all along. It's through him that all of these things occur. It's not through the work of myself or yourself, it's not through your work, it's through his work, it's what he has done, the one God-man, word made flesh, who came to dwell with us. We can't take any credit he did it. He made peace. He has reconciled you to himself. He has brought you into his own presence. 
God initiated it. You didn't initiate it. He did it. And that's what's so great about it. It doesn't have to do with whether you're a sinner, which we all are, or whether you've done great and good things. No, because he initiated it before we ever even thought to. It was all on him. It's a one-sided process. He does virtually everything. All we have to do is to respond. It's not about our achievement, friends. It's not about the things, the the, the cosmic uh, lineup of our good and bad deeds. No, it's about what he has done for us and how and when we are ready to accept it. And he did it in a place and in a time, on a cross, on Golgotha, outside the walls of Jerusalem. And the cross, as I mentioned earlier, is the ultimate evidence that God will go to the most radical extremes to show his love for us and to reconcile us. So what happened there at the cross? It's the ultimate and final sacrifice. Remember that temple system that I mentioned before? Jesus is the final lamb of God, the final and ultimate sacrifice, and the only sacrifice that could take away the sins of the world. That's what happened there at the cross. He took upon himself the thing that stood as a barrier between God and us, sin. And the worst that sin can do is kill, isn't it? And by dying and conquering death, Jesus Jesus exhausted the power of sin and exhausted the power of the evil one. The evil one is defeated. And Jesus did more than that at the cross. He justified us. He made you and me acceptable members of the family of God. You are a son or daughter of the Most High God when you surrender your life to him. Isn't that good news today? That you can be part of the family of God? You've made, been made justified that you could be a part of that family. There is peace between you and God, and Jesus did that. He initiated it for you. And there's been reconcil- reconciliation. We understand what debt is. We've probably all experienced it. But there's no debt anymore because the debt has been paid by what Jesus did. You have been restored to right relationship and love has conquered the very territory that, has, that, that sin has been ruling right here on earth, in the flesh, with men and women. Jesus did it at the cross. And there's been this position shift. We've been talking about it all year. The position shift from light to darkness. We were in darkness. We've come into light. We've gone from being unholy and worthy of being blamed to this scripture says holy and blameless. Could you have done that on your own? Become holy and blameless? But you have been made holy and blameless by what Jesus has done. Scripture is uh, not without very vivid descriptions of those who deny the work of God on the cross. But the flip side, I think, is even more amazing. Even more amazing than the thought of what happens when we deny Christ. 1 Corinthians 15, 19, and 20 says this about the hope that we have. So think about the hope that we have here as I read this passage. And if our hope in Christ is only for this life, We are more to be pitied than anyone in the world. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. He is the first of a great harvest of all who have died. What hope for us that we not only have hope to live a life for him on earth, which is going to be filled with the challenges of this world, but no, we also have a hope to be eternally united with our God And that's the true hope that we all need in our lives. What does he say to us then? What does the scripture tell us? What does Paul tell us that we need to do? Simply this, don't drift away. Those are the words, I love those words, don't drift away, because if you've ever been in any craft on a windy day, you know what it means to to watch your boat, (laughs) your kayak drift away, or have to fight the waves when the wind blows. Don't drift away, says Paul. The effects of this good news that I've tried to share with you today are both instantaneous, they happen in an instant, and also they work themselves out. They have to be worked out. If you decide today that I'm not gonna wait another minute to surrender to my life, my life to Jesus, and you turn your life over to him, a new life begins in an instant. Isn't that amazing? In an instant. The old life is gone, a new life has begun. But here's the problem, you may walk out of the church and sin just the way you normally did. 
Maybe even on the drive home. Who knows? It could happen. And you may say, well, why am I not completely and utterly changed? Well, it's because the Lord wants to work this out with you. He's so, it's such a gentle God. He wants to take us on a journey. He wants to make you the man or the woman that you can't be without him. And that's good news, too, because you don't want to stay the same, do you? I don't. I want to continue to be more and more who he wants me to be. So my challenge to each of us today, and I want to invite uh, our candidates to be, get ready. We're going to have you up here in just a moment. We're going to be doing baptisms today. It's going to be exciting. But I want to end with this simple challenge to each of us today. This is a challenge for all of us sitting in this room and online. It's applicable to every single one of us. Here's the first that, that I want to invite some of you who are on the journey and have not yet necessarily met with Jesus in a personal way. I want to encourage you to discover what Jesus has done. His life, his death, his resurrection. Discover it and respond. Well, how do you do that? The Bible's the best place to go, and we've got plenty of people here at Walnut Hill who would love to help you on that journey. Perhaps even today, you want to make that, that decision where instantaneously you know that you are a new creation. Your new life has begun. Man, we would love to pray for you if that's you. For many of us, though, we've made that decision. We've, we've become reliant upon what God has done for us in Christ. But there's also a challenge for us in this passage. Get back to the gospel. That's the challenge. Get back to the gospel. How do we do that? Well, get back to the good news that you learned about way back when. The simple gospel, we're supposed to be so focused on it. We can get so distracted. Even in Paul's day, the people were getting distracted by the things that were happening around us. And he says, get back to the gospel. Read your Bibles so you actually understand what it says. It's a beautiful thing. It's both very simple and, and amazingly profound. And you're going to find that you can find more and more and more about who this Jesus is and he, what, what he wants for you. And then don't add or subtract from the gospel. Don't add or subtract. It's all we need. It's the fullness of God in Christ found in his word. Friends, we don't need anything more. You must continue to believe this truth and stand firmly in it. Don't drift away from the assurance you received when you heard the good news. Come on up. I'm gonna read one last passage here, the one I started with. And as I do, I wanna encourage you just to close your eyes and meditate on it. Because it's this one verse passage that captures all of what I've tried to share with you today. So would you close your eyes for a second and listen to this verse carefully with me? Meditate on these words. Christ suffered for our sins once for all time. He never sinned, but he died for sinners to bring you safely home to God. He suffered physical death, but he was raised to life in the spirit. 